So welcome everybody to the first ever, hopefully the first of many more, uh, uh, AUB, BFS, BA Film Production <laughs> Industry Day. I think I managed to mention everybody I need to mention. Um, this is, as I've said to you guys before several times, this is your day. This is not an opportunity for, uh, for us to have a talking shop in amongst ourselves. This is very much uh, geared towards you asking the questions that you need to get answered at this point when you're starting to think about your next steps. Some of you I know, I've seen you all over the last couple of weeks in one-to-ones, and I know some of you are a bit stressed, some others not so much. But these guys, everyone here has been invited here because they've got something specific, um, some experiences, lots of knowledge from a variety of different sectors that will be able to help you. So um, once we've done our initial introductions, I'm really hoping and expecting you all to stick your hands up and get everything you possibly can out of this experience. So um, I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves so that you, you can get a full picture of what, they, what they're about and what sector they come from, but I'll just do a very quick intro to each one so that you can start to know who's who. So uh, on my far left, it's Gareth ellis Uh He is a film producer and he is the head of film at Screen Skills, which as he'll explain, is uh, one of the, the key areas for uh, traineeships. A number of people are thinking already about traineeships. So that's, uh, that's where Gareth, Gareth is coming from. He's also an Academy Award winner, which I think is significant to say at this point. Um, Amy uh, Mobley, is that the right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, she is head of production at Euston Films here in London, and she is actually a former student of our course. 10 years ago, when I think there was only three people in each year or something, but uh, uh, she obviously has something even more specific to say because um, she, was, she was one of you. Um, we have Tom Patton, or P Patton? Payton. Payton. Scottish. I know, <laughs> well, he said I went for the other one. Uh, Tom Payton, he is a writer-director, uh, very much more from the independent sector. Uh, I know a number of you will be wanting to go down that route, so um, he's the one to speak to about that. Uh, we have Alice Cabanas, um, who is BFI Network Talent Executive for the Southwest Territory, so she is your new best friend. Uh, we have Elizabeth Stopford, who some of you will know already. Um, she's from the non-fiction sector. Um, I obviously thought it was hugely important to get someone representing uh, the documentary field. Uh, a number of you are interested in that, a number of you are very talented in that area. And uh, she also is the director of her own production company, Rabbit Films. Um, and finally, we have uh, Dion Faro, who is a development executive at BBC Films. So again, uh, please uh, use the fact that Dion is here uh, to the best of your capabilities. Um, so I'm going to pass you over. If we can just go in order, it's probably the best thing to do. And just give us a bit more detail about what you might be able to bring to today. Um, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Gareth ellis Unwin, as Jonathan mentioned. I'm currently the head of film at uh, Screen Skills. Screen Skills is uh, a national agency for skills and training, specifically for the screen sector. Um, we were known uh, up until the 1st of October as Creative Skills Set, um, which was a slightly broader organisation. It also had other disciplines such as fashion, publishing, advertising, and uh, we repurposed our, our sort of ambition. Uh, going into the rebrand uh, at the 1st of October. So we are all of the screen sector in its truest sense. So film, TV, both high-end, non-scripted, um, um, shiny floor TV shows, uh, docs, children's animation, VFX. Basically, if you can consume the content on a screen, uh, we have a hand in it. So we are directly mandated by the, the BFI to deliver on their 10-point plan. Um, that sees £19.4 million being deployed over the next four and a half years. And the two key KPIs that I'm going to be measured against, or we're going to be measured against, is to find, train and retain 10,000 new starts. So that's the big number. I've got to find 10,000 people that want to come and work in the screen sector and make sure that they have the adequate skills to, to make a career of it. 
Uh, in addition to that, I also have to find 15,000 of those that are already working in the industry and help them upskill, because obviously as we bring into the talent delivery pipeline new emergent talent, we've also got to make sure that we're developing the rest of the workforce. And this all comes in the face of a real production boom. Um, the UK is absolutely slammed at the moment. There's hardly any stage space across the UK. Um, a lot of it is inward investment, but we also pay a care to make sure that we're developing indigenous talent on indigenous production, so homegrown is as important as inward investment. But uh, everything is suggesting that the needle's in the red currently and will continue to be for at least four or five years. I was with Lucasfilm this morning and we were talking about how we were going to recruit against five feature films that they've got going into production next uh, this year. So that's the sort of order of magnitude in terms of what, what we're up to. Um, but prior to that, I, uh, I started off as an AD. I was an assistant director for 13 years, got fed up working for producers that didn't know uh, a budget from a schedule, and so set up Bedlam, uh, which I was the CEO of for, for 10 years. We produced The King's Speech, that's the, the big one, but half a dozen other, other movies. And from my, an echo from my former life, although I've been at Screen Skills um, eight months now, actually my next movie comes out on the 29th of March in two months' time. So, yeah, I feel like... Uh, which is? Comes. Uh, Steel Country with, uh, with Andrew Scott and Bronner Wall. Um, so, yes, yeah, that's me. OK, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Tom Payton, um, writer, director and editor. Uh, I'm in my 30s, I just look about 12. Um, I come from the independent sector, like you said. Um, I sort of seized control of my ability to make films. I've four films deep. My fourth one is in post-production now. Uh, I'm actually starting my fifth film uh, in March. I'm supposed to be doing pre-production right now, but I used you lot as an excuse to get myself an extra week. Um, but I got very good at, at the funding element of, of movies. I, I kind of realised if I could seize control of how to bring in the funds to make these films, I could kind of seize control of them creatively. And uh, it's been working very well for me. My second film is on Sky Premiere uh, February 8th. My third one just sold to the US. It's coming out April 9th, I think. Uh, fourth one has just been brought as well, even though it's in post. So things are going really good, but I've kind of got a good base knowledge of all the crap you're about to go into. Um, so, yeah, feel free to ask away. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amy. Um, I'm currently head of production at Euston Films. And 10 years ago, I was sat exactly in this room, um, but on the other side. So I know exactly how you're feeling at the moment. Um, so I guess if anyone wants to ask me anything today, it's about next steps or progression or you know, which way to go. <coughs> I've worked my way up through the production office. I was production runner, production assistant, production secretary, assistant coordinator, coordinator, production manager on um, independent film. And then I made the move across to high-end TV drama um, in recent years um, where I have been, I set up um, the first three series of Peaky Blinders. I've worked on um, and set up the ITV show Good Karma Hospital in the last couple of years. I'm currently in production with an eight-part drama filming in Belfast called Dublin Murders, and we are just in post-production with a six-part of Channel 4 called um, Baghdad Central. So, yeah, that's what I'm up to at the moment. Hi, I'm Alice Cabanius, and I'm the BFI Network Talent Executive for the South West. So BFI Network is the part of the BFI that looks after new and emerging filmmakers, so writers, producers and directors at the very beginning of their career. And it's called a network because it is a network of partners across the UK that deliver on the sort of BFI Network central strategy. Um, I'm quite new in the role as well, same timeline as Gareth actually, about eight months in. It was a completely new um, part of their strategy to put some regional talent executives across England in each of um, the regions. We're based in um, venues or film exhibition hubs, a lot of us, so I'm based in Watershed in Bristol, but I cover the whole of the South West, so that includes you guys um, down in Bournemouth, but also all the way down to Cornwall and all the way across to Hampshire as well. So it's a really big region, but a really exciting region. I'm from Bristol originally, so it's great to be, great to be back there. And, and my role kind of covers a couple of different things. Um, one is to provide on the ground support and development opportunities for filmmakers. Um, we do that through various events that we run across the region. Um, so sort of some labs, workshops, networking events to try and bring people together 
um, develop connectivity and also sort of develop um, talent for writers, directors and producers at that early stage. And then the other part of the role is to connect filmmakers with the national funding opportunities that BFI Network run. So um, that's the Short Film Fund and the Early Feature Development Fund, which is national lottery funds that are distributed via the network. So if you've got any questions about those funding streams, um, I'd probably be able to help you. Um, before that, I was working for the British Council in London. I looked after their short um, film programme. So that was promoting UK shorts internationally, so working with international film festival programmers. Um, and prior to that, I was co-director of Encounters Short Film Festival in Bristol. So any festival questions, I might be able to help with as well. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Stopford. Um, uh, I, I mean, my background is yep, documentary, and um, I started out as a runner at a TV company called RDF, and then kind of worked my way up um, and developed a documentary series which got commissioned um, by the BBC which was um, a kind of, had a constructed element, so it was kind of monastic life, but with five people from different backgrounds that we chose, and they spent six weeks living with monks. So that's kind of how I ended up then working as an AP, and then there was another series, um, and I then produced and directed that series. Um, and in parallel, so that was actually a Tiger Aspect, and in parallel to working there, I was kind of developing my own ideas for kind of slightly more independent documentary films. So I made one for Storyville called I'm Not Dead Yet. Um, and when that was commissioned, I then kind of worked on that and then went back and forth between working for Tiger Aspect, making series that were kind of commissioned and working to a brief but also developing and then making another film for Storyville and then a film for Channel 4 called We Need to Talk About Dad. Um, and then over the last, that was kind of up to 2012 and then I decided that I wanted to work in kind of a slightly more hybrid space so with long form uh, kind of between art, <coughs> documentary and fiction and really um, I guess drawing the craft of filmmaking in the way for kind of more of a theatrical audience. So there's two projects I'm still working on. One is um, about forgiveness, and that's was backed by Film Four and Sundance. And I went on three Sundance Labs: one for sound, one for um, editing, and then also like a, a kind of producing one. So any questions about that kind of strain, or just moving up through the kind of ranks within more kind of television production and series. I'd be very happy to answer. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Dion. I work for BBC Films as a development exec. So BBC Films is one of three public funders in the UK alongside BFI and Film 4. So essentially what we do is commission films to play on our channels. Um, so we have uh, a development slate of about 100 projects. <coughs> but only um, a budget of 10 million, which is the smallest out of us, BFI Film 4. Film 4 have 25 million a year, um, and BFI, I think it is 40 million a year, um, to go into investing in filmmakers such as yourselves. Um, so I work primarily across new and emerging talent with my boss, Eva Yates, who is a commissioning executive um, in the department. So she is an executive producer alongside Rose Garnett on all of the films we make. We make about 12 to 15 films a year. We also do a few short films, um, around seven films we did last year. Um, and that's quite new. So we're essentially a very new team. I started in October, and it feels like a new generation for BBC Films in terms of changing our perception across the industry. So not so much being um, thought, of, thought of as producing films like Victorian Abdul and more kind of period pieces, but really wanting to support um, new filmmakers and kind of be representative of the UK. So um, I'd say just ask me any questions about how commissioning works or how we could potentially help to support you um, if you're looking to make your a short film or how it works in terms of going into making features. Thanks very much. Well, it's a very varied um, selection of people, as I said, and I think everything that you need is effectively here. It's now up to you to ask the right questions. 
Um, afterwards, um, I know that some of you may have to disappear quickly, but I'm hoping that some, some of you may be able to stay for 20 minutes, half an hour afterwards. So if there's anything that you want to go and speak to anyone here specifically, um, I would try and grab them before they leave. But in the meantime, let's get questions started. So hands, please. I suspect this will start slowly and then build up. <laughs> questions, please. Come on. <laughs> yeah, Nina. Um, <laughs> now we find out if I actually know what I'm doing. Um, so essentially, um, we're quite proactive about going out and finding talent that we're interested in. So part of my job involves um, a lot of talent tracking, so trying to go to festivals and watch all of the you know, like new films and um, read a lot of um, you know, writer samples, etc. But we're also getting a lot of submissions from producers, from agents, and just a lot of people that we know. And we have a kind of generic email as well, BBC Films, where people can submit projects to us. And that will go um, and be assessed internally within our team, so that we have a team editorially of seven of us. I mentioned Rose Garnett, who's the director of BBC Films, E.B. Yates, who's commissioner, um, myself and Sam Gordon, who are both development execs, and recently we've appointed a head of development. So we each kind of weekly sit down and go through all of our submissions, and we'll make a decision on what we want to support. And, what, and there's a lot that we can't support, because obviously we're getting a huge amount, like weekly, um, that we have to look at. So, and I mentioned also that we have a budget of 10 million, which obviously reduces how much we can um, fund. So that means that we are usually minority financiers in all of the films that we're supporting. But what we like to do, because we can't offer so much financial um, support, is the editorial support that we'll give to filmmakers. So you'll go through a development process um, if we come on board early um, to get your script into shape and also, you know, to help with um, any questions the producers might have or the writer or director. And then We'll partner with other financiers, so we partner with BFI quite a lot. And that, again, they similarly work um, in the same way that we do. They have their commissioning executives there, they have development executives. Um, and then we'll also put production financing into a film to get them made. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want me to try and expand a bit more. Yes? <laughs> um, so, okay, to give you an example of a film that we have supported. So this is like a slightly different situation, actually. So we have three films in um, at Sundance this year. We have something called Dirty God, which is by a Dutch filmmaker called Sasha Polek and a writer called Suzanne Farrell. And I wasn't involved in that because I've only been there since October. But when... Um, my boss joined BBC Films. That project had been developed with BFI over a number of years, and they were getting ready to go out for production financing. Um, so they would have had a budget of, say, I don't know, like three million. And so they need to um, get that financing in place in order to get that film made. Uh, so they came to us and said, we're looking for X amount of money. Do you want to be involved? We'll take a look at the script. We'll take a look at the talent. Um, and decide whether we want to. So we came on board, um, sorry, is that me? Um, and gave some money towards getting that film made. So that's essentially what we're doing. We're, we're a financier, um, but we're involved editorially in the films that we are producing. Okay. Alex? So I'm checking. The way I'm thinking is that every year there's about 1,000, maybe more than 1,000 graduates of film studies or film production that want to get into the industry. Uh, my question is, what can we do in order to uh, be the best ones for you? You know, uh, what would you be looking in a potential uh, collaborator, a potential new filmmaker? What, what do you want to bring? 
think this is, this, I feel like this is the central question for the yeah. day, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I mean, you, you, you're not wrong. Um, I did a desk-based audit when I first came into Screen Skills, and I found out that there's 15,500 BA, MA, and other courses in the UK uh, that run each year that have the word film, media, TV, writing, or digital in its title. So 15,500 courses pumping out probably 20 to 30 grads each. You, you get a sense of the, the volume. So it's not 1,000. You're talking up near the, the, the sort of tens of thousands. Um, I think things that mark people out are getting the basics right. So, for example, we run a scheme called Trainee Finder. Uh, and I think there's a couple of applications already in, Jonathan was saying for that, and that's basically where uh, we go through a recruitment process, we um, invite to interview, we had about 15,000 applicants this current year, uh, that boils down to about 400 that cut, get called for interview. We do ask people to self-identify which department they want to go into, and Screen Skills is slightly different from the BFI because we're more about the sort of craft and tech based skills, so they're below the line, uh, more than above the line. Um, and through that process, we then get that down to a cohort. Uh, previously, it's been about 75 trainees a year. We're doubling up for this year because of how busy it is. So 150 trainees will join us in camera, sound, construction, production office, locations, editing. We're bringing on VFX trainees for the first time this year and some animation trainees. But we basically manage your career for a year. So we work with the productions. We find placements. You are an employee of that production should you get... Uh, taken on and there's a co-share on your salary so for that year of that first year you're sort of in a managed situation you've got a bit of a safety net underneath you um, and it's surprising how many people get the basics wrong so you know when you say well, what can we do to shine um, the first thing is to get the basics right read the guidelines understand the application put the effort into those documents I mean we did a first sift of our application and something like 30 percent hadn't provided two references and it's clearly stated on the guidelines we need two references so unfortunately they go to one side so basics first and then worry about how you sparkle um, and I was sharing with Jonathan earlier you know in terms of that sparkle it comes in a variety of different ways it's not always just about what you've achieved within your chosen craft area but you know who you are as a person outside of that what do you take an interest in in life what are those other things because we're not just looking for a camera robot or a sound robot you know we're looking for someone that can go and be a meaningful part of a crew and interact so we always sort of pay a care to to, to how full of formed the the, the the person is but it really is a thing i mean it, it breaks my heart when i see really really good opportunity go squandered um, because the basics aren't right you know so start there yeah, i think you're pretty much on message as far as the sta our staff team is concerned in terms of trying to promote this idea that you're looking for people with technical skills but also the soft skills, the ability to get on with people and adapt and be flexible. And I mean, so it's so funny, I, I bit back in a panel two weeks ago when someone referred to it as a soft skills. There's nothing soft about knowing how to write a CV or market mm. yourself or run your own taxes. These are business skills and I think we don't give them the right credibility in terms of how we ready people for work. So, you know, that you're absolutely right, that's a big part of it, it's everything that goes around the sure. actual technical ability. Yeah. Can, we, can I just add yeah. to that as well? Because like, there's not enough production coordinators out there. There's not enough production accountants. You know, there's so many grades that need... And we're crying out for good trainees at the moment. And I actually sit on the board at Screen Skills, uh, Screen Skills on the high-end TV. And for every production that pays into the um, UK tax break, we can access um, a certain amount of trainees. And they've changed the scheme slightly, but say, for example, on Peaky Blinders, every series, I'd have six trainees, one in accounts, one in camera, one maybe in post-production, different grades. And, you know, I've seen them come in, I've seen them fail, and I've seen them flourish. And, you know, we just want people to come in enthusiastic, be on time, fill out your training programme, be able to work in a crew. And, you know, as soon as you get that one job, you will be in with that department and you will fly because there's demand and everyone is working. They're so busy. Crew are now going for, like, working 50 weeks a year because, you know, they're going from job to job to job. So all you have to do... Go in as a camera trainee, work hard at, you know, if, if you've, you're a DAP by specialism now, you know, go, don't be afraid to just be camera department runner, cable basher for one show, because as soon as you're in with that DAP, you're away, you'll be up, and, and in a couple of years' time, you're going to be a key, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do think that the, the, the screen industry is unique in, its, in, it, in as much as, you know, you wouldn't go to automotive college and think you're going to come out and design a Ferrari as your first job. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't go into pharmaceutical and say you're going to, you know, release a cure for cancer within the first week of being there. But we do see a lot of people that are only interested in those above line grades. And mm -hmm. for Amy and I, both of us coming from a real production background, me with the AD world, you with production, you know, it's a crying shame that people aren't more seduced by that work, which is a real credible career that will get you, you know, advancement and stuff. So yeah, look beyond the, the above the line. I'm the question The question is sometimes asked, I think, which is a reasonable question, particularly during admissions interviews. Uh, they might say, um, well, I can go and be a runner right now, so why, why would I want to come to university for three years to end up being a runner at the end of it? Mm. I mean, my answer to that is always that, that we, are, we are expanding them in ways far more than the technical, so that when they come out, they'll advance much quicker than they would if they'd gone in without that. Would that be yeah. fair? Is I, that... I mean, I'm testament to yeah. that, okay. because I came out at uni at 24, and I remember that at this event there was a BBC really high up guy and I was like within a year I'm going to be a production coordinator and he laughed at me and he was like there's no way you're going to do that. Now I had produced over 10 short films, I'd been, we'd had um, a couple of productions come over the summer in Bournemouth, um, German uh, for ZDF, they were making you know trashy romance novel things filming on the beach in Bournemouth and you know I went and did that production run and production assistant you know just to get in there and just to say that I'd done it. And then I came out and the, uh, one of the production managers that I'd worked with then took me on to a feature as production assistant. They then went on to this a Bollywood film and then I was production secretary. And then she, the lime juice that I was working with, went and produced the Red Riding trilogy for Channel 4 and gave me my first gig as production coordinator. And that was, and I was 24. So, you, go. you know, you it. it does, you know, the you have the skills and you, you've been mirroring the way that a crew works in the industry you know, making your films now. So you know the discipline, it's just on a bigger scale. So don't be afraid to go back a bit because you've got those skills and you will fast track really quickly. Mm -hmm. Tom, um, obviously, you know, you're, you're making your own films and sort of playing your own path in some ways. Um, what kind of things do you look for in, in, in the people that you take on for oh, your crew? Honestly, I think you hit the nail on the head when you were talking about the, the truth is, it's word of mouth that gets you hired in the indie sector because, you know, we'll be looking for certain crew members. And, I mean, the best piece of advice is, like, be really good at one thing at least. You know, like, it's good to, it's good to sort of have a skill set that kind of crosses a lot of boundaries, particularly in the indie world, because you become very valuable to producers and directors like myself when we know we can kind of crooks on people who can kind of uh, handle more than one job. But the, the key thing is to be really good and also, like... Like, who you know is very important. You know, a lot of the crew that I use, so my director of photography is a former uh, Bournemouth student just like yourselves, and a lot of the crew that we've used across the four films are people he knows from this course, who he recommends and he feels have got a good attitude. And, you know, I think the basics is a good one as well. I mean, one of the most important, important basics for me is... Um, is your attitude on set, you know, a sort of a, a can-do willingness to make this thing come to life. You know, it might not be your film, you might not even like the script, but the fact that you're there and you're giving it 110% will, will not only put you in good stead to come back with that director and that production team, but they'll also recommend you when we're going to mixers and other directors are asking me, oh, I need a sound guy or I'm looking for, you know, a good gaffer, I'll recommend the people I've worked with because I'm like, they won't give you any crap, which is kind of what you're looking for. Like, as you all know, you know, when you're on set, film is hard. Like, it's, it's, I mean, we love it, but it's, they're not easy days, you know. You don't go into filmmaking because you want an easy day, and you need to surround yourself with a team of people who are there to try to make it as smooth as possible. So if you go at something with an attitude of, well, I'm going to make sure I'm heard, chances are you're going to get yourself quite a bad reputation very quickly. So, you know, the basics in terms of your attitude, and also, you know, that word of mouth from that camaraderie between known people will, will do you well over the next 10 years, I think. It's never, it's never been easier than now to network. You know, I mean, um, some of us have got a bit more grey about us, you know, remember, we didn't have the social platforms we do now. You know, I think I got my first mobile phone whilst I was at film school. You know, so there are networks that exist, there's things that you can tap into, there's resources that you can... And also companies are now reachable. 
you know you don't need just an event like today you know you can get in touch with companies and individuals um, and so I think you know you should embrace that in the appropriate form of contact. I mean the, look, the runner for the last film I just did so I was at a mix of events a friend of mine was running it he asked me to come along there was a young guy 21 um, and he came up to me and he's got a piece of paper that he's, he's obviously cut into the shape of cards because he can't afford business cards and it says run at and his name and the phone number and he pitched himself you know he told me how hard he was going to work and all this stuff and I just thought you know what I, I, I kind of respect the gumption on this guy. So we gave him a job, it was amazing, and now he's coming back and we're promoting him on the next film. So, you know, that kind of can-do attitude and getting out there will, will really do you well. You just have to go and do it, you know? So lots of people currently tearing out bits of tape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we go uh, above the line we've been talking about, uh, uh, you know, Alice, what we all know, I mean, I've been in this, in this kind of situation in the past, distant past now, where you know you're applying for something that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are all applying for in terms of funding opportunities and so on. Mm. I mean, to go back to Alex's original question, what what is it that that really tends to um, uh, sparkle? Was the word that you used? What 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 is it that attracts you to certain applications or? Yeah. So I mean, I think first of all, this all this advice is absolutely excellent because. You know, you're, if you're aspiring to, you know, pursue a career as a writer, director, producer above the line, you're not going to be able to have a sustainable career within those roles straight away. You know, it's, it is going to take you a certain amount of time. So, you know, if that is your aspiration, you know, absolutely run for it, go for it, but make sure that you're taking on board all of this other advice you've been given today. Um, I think I'm going to echo a lot of the other things initially that have been said already. Read, read the guidelines, like read them really thoroughly if you're going for a funding stream. You know, this is, again, about getting the basics right before we even come to the story. Um, make sure that you know whether that's suitable or not for you. Collaborators are really, really key. So, you know, we will um, look quite closely at the funding applications that come through and look at the team as a team. We are here to support stories and bold narratives, but we're also here to support people and to support teams to grow. Um, so you guys are in an, a perfect situation right now to make potential collaborations that will see you through. Um, you know, I'm working with teams at the moment. A lot of them studied together. A lot of them have, you know, might even not still be in the same region, but have pulled back together for a project so you know, you're, you're right in the situation now where you should be making those um, collaborations in terms of what we look for um, in an application um, we don't often know it till we see it um, in terms of what sparkles or shines you know that's 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 the nature of it and I know that's can be quite frustrating to hear when you want a bit of a clearer steer but sometimes we don't know it until we see it but I think what we do always look for is um, a real authenticity, and again, this is a word you'll hear battered about a lot, um, but I think it's really important to try and understand what, what, what's meant by that, and you know, a genuine connection to the stories that you want to tell. We're looking to work with filmmakers that really have a burning desire to tell um, that story and to get the, the stories out there, so I think a real authentic connection with the story you're telling is really important. Um, to have a, a sort of sense of, you know, what can you do to make yourself sparkle and shine when you're looking for, you know, commissioning or funding? Well, we need to see what you can do now because you're not going to receive national funding without a body of work to evidence what your creative vision or directorial voice is. So whether that's shooting on an iPhone or your student piece of work or another grassroots non-professional piece of work, we will be looking um, quite closely at, at people's work. And it doesn't have to be polished and it doesn't have to be festival ready, but we're looking for something in there. We're looking to get a sense of, um, of you and your voice and your vision. Um, I think those will be my starting points. <laughs> OK, I suspect there may be more. Elizabeth, you've obviously gone through, the, as you said, the various steps up. Mm. What, what would be the tips that you would give people that would be starting off at the... See, I mean, I, I think this, I guess to echo Gareth a bit, this idea of viewing at least a first kind of chapter as an apprenticeship and taking advantage of the opportunities that are there. I mean, there are a lot of different schemes that you can apply for and working within the industry in whatever kind of role, I mean, I think you can also, if your you know, aspiration is to um, do something like write and direct or, you know, that kind of work, you can always be developing that alongside. 
and have kind of pocket, you know, and I mean, certainly that was my kind of approach was to say I'm going to be in the industry and then I'm meeting people and, and you know, getting a sense that it feeds back in. And then at a certain point when it's developed enough, you know, I'm going to go to to reveal or whatever it is and establish it. I, I then set up a production company at that point. And I, and I think a lot of people coming out kind of often will say, oh, maybe I'll set up a production company and, you know, we can all work together. And I mean, that can work, but it's quite, there's quite a few people that can pull that off right away. And, and also, I guess, just getting more of a sense, getting your feet wet and a sense of how the industry really works and allowing, yeah, your kind of um, place within that to become clearer and what, you know, what you want to do, you know, in a, in a way you can kind of explore that um, for real. So I think that kind of not isolating yourself off is a really good plan for the beginning. Yeah, um, and just the schemes, I think, there's, there's so many opportunities, obviously, the ones that, you know, been touched on, but the, I mean, I did a, like, researchers training scheme and then I got onto, I think, the guiding lights, like the BFI's guiding light scheme when I wanted to move more into kind of film, you know, more theatrical film and things like that. I mean, they are there and you can also be working and then apply for them and then that's your break that says, okay, you know. So I think... Um, and a number of those schemes, there. like guiding lights and inside pictures yeah. and, and other things, you know, um, a lot of what we're talking about today isn't either or. You know, it's as well as, and opportunity yeah. too. You know, I mean, most of us, I would imagine, although we've, for, for speed, given quite a clear linear progression to our own careers, truth is, it's quite organic as you go. You know, you, you'll step sideways, you'll step up, you'll sit mm -hmm. down, you'll have a bit of a pause, you'll pull your hair out because you don't want to do it anymore and then go back in. So it's like, it isn't mm -hmm. like this sort of checkbox exercise of A plus B plus C <coughs> equals D. And I really encourage people, especially at your age, you know, and, and at the start of this journey, um, it's to not close yourself up to opportunity. I know that some of my best breaks came about by sort of obscure means, and it was just I was mm -hmm. prepared to be accepting of that change that, that helped yeah. me get to where I am, I am now. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants this sort of really clear cut plan, yeah. mm -hmm. no deviation. Yeah. I think what Tom said earlier was really interesting about um, networking and putting yourself out there as well, because sometimes it's good just to ask questions, you know. I, I'm really responsive if I get an email from somebody uh, like asking me for career advice or, you know, I've, I've been mentored by people that have really helped my career progression. One of them was a formal mentoring scheme. A couple of them were informal and it was me just emailing people saying, can I buy you a coffee because I really want to find out how you got to where you are. And you, you would, you'd be surprised at how many people are responsive to that. Not everybody is, but hey, you've lost an email. And I think it's maybe an underused thing. It's like a direct approach to someone if you admire them or admire their work. It's a short film you've seen. Um, you know, you really, you know, you really admire that director style. You could drop them a line if it's somebody whose career path you you admire. Could you, you know, seek them out? And then opportunities like this, you know, afterwards today, come up and talk to us. You know. I might have to dash off quite quickly, but <laughs> I will be here for a bit. And you know, I'm here, I'm here to meet new filmmakers. That's my job. So. Like be 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 a bit bold. I know it's frightening. The word networking is is a horrible mm. word, yeah. um, but you've got to you've got to be a bit bold in it. I think on those emails, mm. I'm just going to say because I get two or three every day at the moment. So just be specific. Mm. So you know, just doing a blanket and saying, "Here's yeah. my CV. Mm. Have you got anything for me?" I kind of read it and I'm going, "Well, oh, you know, unless they've been to Bournemouth, obviously I meet them." <laughs> <laughs> just put that but, in the heading yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, if they email me and say, I've seen this drama recently, mm -hmm. I'm really interested yeah. to know how did you decide to go and shoot in that country? How did you put the finance plan together for that? What was the development process for that show? And I'm like, oh, actually, they've done their research. Yeah. They know what they're talking about. They know what I'm about. And so they know what they're, I'm, you know, and then I'm like, OK, I'll... Exactly. You, you're, you're being strategic, your time in. totally, yeah. And the number of emails that you get, yeah, that aren't... I mean, I mean from just, my... Oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, it's just in terms of... Kind of just picking up that point of if you know if you've got an idea of something that you want to make that you think could be viable, you could either take it directly you know to kind of these kind of guys, or you could also look to partner, and that you could play a kind of strategic game where you say okay, you know this is a production company that makes the kind of series or films or whatever it is, and I'm going to 
you know, approach them, research them, approach them, even if I go in as a runner, and I know I've got this up my sleeve. And at a certain point, you know, when I've kind of put myself in a relationship with the right person, I say, look, you know, is it, are you interested in this? And they might take it, you know, on, and you could be involved in whatever way seems appropriate, and then that's a step up. Um, so that's one way to kind of get in. Or you can obviously approach a company and just say, look, we've got this idea, or I've got this idea, would you support it? And then go to a commissioner. So just as a, as a way as well of, you know, that's a slightly different route to you. And it's the importance of researching who it is you're going to speak to, I think, mm -hmm. is coming clear. I think crewing-wise, what you were saying about being, <clears throat> being bold, it really helps. And a lot of it is actually, like, from my perspective anyway, when you're dealing, like more independently, um, you know, because bearing in mind I'm going out there and I'm, you know, I might raise like, you know, one and a half million, but it's very sort of managed by a small team of people. And, you know, we're not really answering to anyone. We're allowed to kind of do what we want with it because, well, I raised it. And, and it kind of makes it almost opportunistic for the crew because it might be that, you know, someone comes up to me at a mixer or sends an email just at the right time and I'll be like, mm. you know what, we don't have that guy. Uh, see if this guy's any good. And a lot of the time, a lot of the crew would pick up, it's almost like it's just bold people being bold at the right time. That, you know, and then inadvertently end, they end up on the team. And you know, don't get me wrong, we've made some mistakes. We've hired some people who we wouldn't hire again from that approach. But a lot of my core team now that I really, you know, as a, as a filmmaker and as somebody trying to tell a story, like I really you know, find myself cruxing on, are people I met exactly like that, just bold at can or bold at a mixer in London and now I love them you know but again you've talked about the a moment of opportunity and you know again it, it's it's really upsetting when when I'm talking more about my bedlam time now where you'd say to someone okay genuinely interested in you but there just isn't something right for now if you get in touch in six months time we're going to be probably crewing up for xyz and you don't hear from them again mm -hmm. you know how basic <laughs> is it to put a note in your diary to say okay a week before the date that they said I'm going to reach out to Tom again mm -hmm. remind him where I saw him or heard him speak um, so that, I mean, again, it's, it's basics, isn't it? It's basic sort of business People strategy. People will rarely ask you yeah. to follow up if they don't mean it. I would, yeah. ne I would never yeah. please follow me up in an email if I didn't genuinely mean it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More questions, please. Yeah. I can't see everyone up the back, so you'll just need to... Uh, just out of curiosity, um, the landscape will be changing obviously, Brexit as well. Yeah, sure. Basically, Brexit, how's filmmaking going to be changing after Brexit? In your opinions, obviously, speculation at the moment. There we go. <laughs> uh, uh, pass. <laughs> uh, it, it sort of depends which bit of the landscape you're talking about. I mean, there are some often quoted stats. So, for example, VFX and animation currently, 36% of those that work in those sectors are uh, non-British nationals. So, you know, whether the settlement visas come through and they can resolve the issue over what the, the pay gap, what the um, pay ceiling is. I think, you know, you will see an outflow of talent. Um, we are already witnessing that it's becoming more awkward for us to co-produce with you outside of the UK. A friend of mine was in touch just the other week because we've got this dual issue where the content we create in the UK will still be deemed European content, but the spend that takes place within the UK because it's likely to be outside the European economic area will not qualify. And a lot of those sort of higher level co-productions are based on equitable spend. So, for example, currently if you co-produce with Belgium, there's a very healthy tax rebate in Belgium, but that is based on an appropriate spend commensurate in the UK and that qualifying as UK spend. So there is some sort of awkward bits around co-production. Personally, I think there's some opportunity there. Um, you know, if the workforce, for whatever reasons, is depleted of areas of talent, then surely there is an opportunity there to infill with some indigenous talent. Um, and that's not to say Britain's best. It's just to say that, you know, there will be producers and productions that need crew that maybe previously they had looked to our European partners to resolve, particularly in sort of stop motion animation and certain sort of niche areas like that, where they will have to find UK talent. So I think you're actually at the dawn of a very interesting time coming in to the industry. I'm one of the few people that sees a bit of opportunity in Brexit. Okay, more positive answer than you may have expected. Anyone else? I mean, I, I, I can add to that bizarrely. I mean, I, when obviously, you know, we voted out, there was a, a sort of a knee-jerk panic in me. And I have no idea how it's going to affect distribution and, and how we get our films out there to market. But bizarrely, from an independent perspective, again, where, you know, because I'm raising money 
private equity, I've sort of had this bizarre experience where people who've been in you know a particular industry for however many, and a lot of private equity money will not come from people who've got any film background at all. It tends to come from guys who've sort of you know 55 plus who are Dentist. just add enough really, <laughs> and feel like you know I've made enough money in life and now I'd like to take some some risks with it. And um, I found the whole idea of Brexit has kind of made people go, oh, well, sod selling this, I'm going to go and do film instead. So it's kind of had this weird effect on me where I've you know I've I've been getting contacted more about financing. So, again, I don't know how that affects distribution because at the end of the day, you've got to remember, you can't make a film and then it's like, well, there I go, I made it. Like, that film has to have a home. It has to, you know, make its money back. And one of the key things for me is is making money back on my movies because the minute that doesn't happen, that faith in you as a, as a filmmaker dissipates and it's much harder to make a next one. So I put a lot of focus on that and I don't really know how Brexit will affect, affect that element. So I guess we'll find out soon. Okay. Yep. Uh, you were talking about uh, indigenous talent. Um, in your opinion, what would you say to someone that is obviously not from the UK, for example, I'm from Spain, but I'm interested in going into post-production, uh, working in the, in the UK if, if possible? What would you say from that to someone that's from the EU who wants to work here? I mean, I think in the absence of there being clarity, we have to proceed as if business as usual. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would be knocking on the door of Lip Sync and telling Peter and Norman that you desperately need a job and that you are the bestest thing they're ever going to get to see. I'd be championing walking down Fubert's place and getting in front of Julie at... Molinaire and telling her how, how brilliant you are. I think, you know, in the absence of clarity, we've got to keep going as, as, as we think it, it might roll out. So I definitely wouldn't want anyone who is um, non-Indigenous, UK national, to feel disheartened and, and feel like they're in this sort of weird stasis. I mean, we've just got to crack on. Yeah. Okay. Behind Nina, first time. Yep. Sorry, it's getting some going. Um, so as a... Uh, a kind of like writer director one of the um the big things kind of moving forwards for post university is the the kind of terrifying idea of trying to finance films um so like this is kind of like a wider question to the panel but based on what tom was saying um regarding kind of season control of the financing of your own films um is there kind of any sort of like tips and tricks regarding um kind of networking to to get that kind of financing moving forwards or I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, like, uh, hopefully, I don't. I'm not about to say something that might upset anyone. But I, I obviously, like, like everybody, you know, I wanted to be a writer director. I spent a lot of time on honing the skills I didn't already possess. So I, I started to teach myself how to become an editor, um, and then I start. Once I kind of felt like, well, I'm really proficient at this, I started teaching myself how to do CGI. Now I'm a really competent CGI artist as well. And, you know, I kind of had this mentality where three hours a day, regardless of what the day was like, I was going to commit to learning an aspect of post. So that in my own head, as ridiculous as I look back and think of it now, like I was like, well, I can be a one-man army. You know, in hindsight, that's not film. Film is so collaborative and you have to have a good team around you. But it kind of gives you this sort of uh, empowerment that, you know, in a worst-case scenario, I can get this done. And... You know, I kind of made the jump from commercials, uh, you know, over into sort of, you know, longer form bits and pieces. But I, I went down the route. I had a film script. Um, we went, you know, down the Creative England route. And, and you know, it was, and it was all very slow going. And, and for me, I have this background where I was, I was also making money from what I was doing. So I kind of taught myself to be a salesman. And I started to realise that although story was crazy important, that actually I kept hitting this brick wall where... It wasn't really about the quality of my work, which I thought was good. It started to become about, yeah, but we, need to, we also need to make sure this product's going to make money. And a lot of that started to rest on, yeah, but how sellable are you as an artist? And so I had this bizarre approach where I was like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to make a really cheap movie. I'm going to go outside the system and I'm going to make loads of money back on it. And then I can prove to people like the BFI that, you know, people buy my stuff. And bizarrely, what happened was all of a sudden I didn't need to go to the BFI. I was starting to people offering me money because I had proven that I could make something. And, and you can be very strange how you think about these things. I think thinking outside the box helps. You know, I made a film for 
75 grand, uh, went to a subscription box company who sell, you know, Marvel wristbands and stuff to mystery customers. Said, I've got a sci-fi film. Uh, I'd, I'd like to put it in your box. They said, sure, we'll have uh, 90,000 of them, please, for £2.50 each. So now I'm already in profit, and the books are there. So now people are more willing to give you money because you, you did something that proves you're not in this just to make a passion piece. And look, don't get me wrong, I do genuinely believe this in my heart. If you were opening a jeans company, you would make the best, most on fashion jeans so they sell. You're not going to start selling flares out your shop and hoping people want to buy them. And I think that's the mistake filmmakers make. You know, you, you are asking for money and, you know, at the end of the day, that money's coming from somebody's pocket and they don't want to just... If they wanted to just lose it, they could have a bonfire in the garden with it, you know? <laughs> so you have to prove that you're making something with an audience that, you know, people want to see. And it doesn't mean you can't take risks and it doesn't mean you can't be creative, but you do have to think about your business side of things. And that is the one element I see time and time again in talented directors whose work I love but they have no acumen for business and no desire to even learn it. And if that is you, that's okay. Find a producer that handles that element for you uh, and work closely with them, you know? That's... I mean, from, from your anecdote there, I mean, what you clearly did was you found a motivated audience for, by whatever means. We had similar experiences with Kajaki. I produced a, a military film four years ago, and one of the first groups that we went to, which we did through a Kickstarter campaign, was looking at those that had served previously in, in, in the army thinking that those that had done well probably wanted to pay a little bit back. You know, it's like your allegiance with the school. You know, you have this, you know, your own, your own journey often leads you to want to sort of pay things back. So that we, we launched a Kickstarter campaign that was solely targeted at that sort of military diaspora, and that then gave us enough money to go and do some location scouting, and it sort of builds in, it, in increments. But, you know, you're absolutely right. As soon as... You can make any movie you want, and, and you know, I think I, I, I sometimes sound like I'm sort of beating down on the non-commercial, but absolutely, you, you can make whatever film you want. If it's going to cost you more than you have in your pocket or you have access to, you will need to be able to demonstrate an audience. If you need to demonstrate an audience, you need to be able to market to that audience and you start to sort of build this sort of the nature of the, the commercialization of a, of, a, of a piece of content. Um, but yeah, most, finding a motivated audience that is predisposed to the type of stories. I mean, do you have a particular genre you like Playing with, exploring with. Um, myself, I've been doing a lot of, like social media stuff recently. Right. Uh, what would be the most? Here we go. We've got a panel of experts. What would be the motivated audience for for, for social realism? <clears throat> T TV, I think, to be honest. I mean, it's... Look, I mean, here, here's the thing from my perspective, right? And it's the one element no one ever wants to tell you about, right? And that is, once you've made your film, what happens? Especially if it was independent. Um, and the truth is, you're going to... You know, you, everybody has this, like, first Cannes film experience where they go over there and it's like, oh, I've made it to Cannes, that's it now. You know, you booked your EasyJet flight for 90 quid and you're going to be the next thing in Hollywood. And you get there, and I did this too, and you walk into this sales floor that is just a sea of more movies than you could ever wrap your brain around. Yeah. And there are things like uh, dog pirates in space and stuff you just like, that got made. Yeah. And um, it terrifies you. That first experience is terrifying because you that, suddenly realise... And the 18 euro coffees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, you suddenly realise, oh, my God, like, I'm, my art is lost in a sea of business. And it becomes very difficult because you'll have that pressure of... You, you took that money from someone. Now, if you, if you were lucky enough to be funded... Um, you know, nationally, then you're going to have the support network around you because they're only really picking projects that they know will probably go there. But if you've taken that bold risk to spend 25 grand that your nan left to you in a will, um, it's going to be a much more difficult game you're going to play. And the, the key is to, to make something that you know has an audience because the first thing the sales agent is going to do is go, well, that's not going to sell to anyone. And you're going to get the old classic of, uh, well, who's it got in it? Well, of course, it hasn't got anybody in it. You made it for 25 grand. So you need to be thinking about who the audience for this is and be able to back that up, you know, and, uh, and make sure you're approaching that film, you know, with commercial viability, because as soon as you do that, people will want to give you more money, you know. And, and, and it sounds ridiculous, you know. And I, I'm very proud of all the films I've made, but, you know, my first film I made in 2015, and I'm about to start my fifth at 3 million, and it's only because the first one made its money back, the second one made its money back, the third one's made its money back before it's released, and it's because I was taking that into account when I was putting it together. You don't need to let it, you know, damage your, your artistic integrity. 
you can still make something you're passionate about. You can still find a way to package social realism into something commercial that a mass audience want to watch. You can still be proud of it, but you, you do have to think about it. It's, it's so important. Alice, you talked earlier on about the kind of applications you get mm. for, for the, you know, the, the funding bodies and funding opportunities and so on. How far do you look for films that are going to generate money and have commercial possibilities? Uh, I, not at all with the funds that, um, that, that we oversee. We look after the um, funds for new and emerging talent, as I said, and when we... Um, that has different meanings depending on who you ask. So we define, the BFI network defines new and emerging talent um, as filmmakers who are working in their early shorts, up to calling card shorts, up to early feature development. So the minute you've had um, a feature film produced or distributed or you're looking for development or production funding for your feature film, the BFI Central Film Fund takes over. So they're sort of slightly, they're, they are different parts. Um, so we, in terms of the short film fund and the early feature development fund, for the short film we wouldn't look at any sort of commercial um, necessity with those films. That really is about supporting writer directors at that stage in their career, about um, you know supporting them to tell the stories that that we want to support them to tell and to um, help them progress onto the next stage. So th the fund is. Um, is responsive. It, it doesn't fund first-time shorts, so you, you wouldn't be able to come to the funding stream without any work, but it does now support work at a much earlier level, so you could come with some non-professional work, like I said, a grassroots piece of filmmaking, a student short, and, and it, it will um, support those films at that earlier stage. Equally, it goes up to calling card short, so we would be looking to support teams to make those short films that were that bridge on to their first feature. And there's another fund called an, uh, the Early Feature Development Fund, which is a fund for writers, and I mean, within that, um, Within that fund, again, we wouldn't be assessing it on um, sort of the commercial viability necessarily of that film. It would be about the writer and the idea. We'd be really, really looking at that. Um, it's, you know, BFI Network is where you need to think about looking if you are aspiring to be a writer, director, producer, and you want to continue, you want to create your own work after university. You want to start working in shorts. You've got ideas for short films. You're wondering where you get funding. It's one place you can go. And I think what you said is absolutely on the nail. You shouldn't wait around for funding. There isn't a huge amount of it out there. We can't fund all the applications that we get in, sadly. Um, and there are other ways of raising money for your films. And if you have a burning desire to tell a story, you need to find a way to make that happen. And hanging around for funding you know, is not always gonna, gonna be the thing that you should be doing. I think do, doing both. Like, you, you can make the application and, and still be working on your internal business. You know, and and you know, if if that happens first, then great. Oh, yeah, and then if that happens first, then yeah. it's just it's just the sort totally. of totally. And yeah. you know, you you like I said earlier, you're not going to make a living out of your short films. You know, it's I'm sorry, <laughs> it's to be the bearer of bad news. It's you know, it's what you need to do if you're aspiring alongside when you're creating this career and a sustainable career within the sector, of which the opportunities are fantastic right now. So you need to be developing your skills, honing your craft. You know creating that sustainable career for yourself whilst you are, you know, aspiring to t tell your own stories as well. Yeah, and the same as Alice, um, BBC films aren't commercially driven. I think that's the luxury of working at the BBC and using um, taxpayers' money to fund what we're doing. Um, and any films that we make that do make money, that just goes back into our budget, annual budget. Um, but I would just say, yeah, if you're kind of worried about uh, navigating the funding world, definitely trying to find producers to collaborate with if you're a writer or director is really useful um, a really useful relationship to have and also I think researching all of the funding that's available beyond the um, public funders I think there's a lot of uh, an appetite to support short films these days there's I've spoken to people at Vero who are kind of interested in exploring um, having short film funds there their Bumble do mm -hmm. their kind of annual female force and support um, give five female filmmakers <coughs> 20,000 to make a short film. So United just really... United Kingdom at the moment as well, haven't you? Yeah. United Kingdom, Nowness. Yeah, Yeah. so just really look like, mm -hmm. just explore what's out there um, beyond having to kind of self-fund, which a lot of people do do for their first films. Okay, any more? Yep. Hi, um, we've talked about film quite a lot recently, um, but I wanted to go back to the, the kind of commercial side of it. Now, I've spent the last three years at uni making short films alongside the course, 
And only recent, I've done all the festival routes and stuff like that, but I've only recently been told about spec commercials. Um, would you say that's quite a good avenue to explore, um, to also spend your money towards? I'd need someone to tell me what one of those is. Yeah, um, to start with. It's, base, it's <laughs> like uh, making a, a like fake a commercial. Script, yes, no. yeah, spec commercial for... Like a, like, a, like, a tra like a trailer to show off your piece, is that what you mean? Uh, no, it's like... Um, Sort of proof of concept for a brand that you send yes. to the brand, get them excited, yeah. and they uh, might yeah, kind of, but you give actually you hundreds make, of you actually... thousands of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you actually make the commercial for yeah. the brand before right. actually getting commissioned to do it, to show oh, them I what mean, you can writers do. Writers write spec scripts. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that's it, kind of going back to earlier. It's like it, if the timing's right, then I guess that will work for you. Look, there's no, there's no right way into the industry. You know, I think I'm proof of that. <laughs> um, What's it's the length bonkers. of a spec commercial? Yeah. Because I would rather see the first ten minutes of your feature. If you if you if you could shape your short film as the first ten minutes of your feature, and you showed me that, and I was like, I want to see more, then that would that to me would be more than a taster. Because a taster, you're just putting highlights. You can make it shiny. You can edit it cleverly. You can put some jazzy music on. But if I saw ten minutes of real drama, and I was like, I I want more of that. That would be more of a clincher for me. Are you on about like making a McDonald's commercial and then McDonald's hire you? Is that what you mean? Uh, kind of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Obviously. More I thought you meant brand. making a spec commercial like of your piece. No. 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 Kind of so, so you like you know you you, you, you get your mate in some nice Nike shoes. You make a commercial. You send it to Nike. You hope they book you. Um, it's pure pun. There's so much me. short form yeah. content and um, internet channels that you can that are looking for that kind of content. So if you're if you are a writer, director, or producer, and you want that avenue, that's just again another platform that you can, you know, that, that is going to be useful for you to get your next step. You know what I would do if that's where you want to go. Truthfully, find out who is the production company that's making the Nike adverts, mm. and then make your little spec thing if you want, and then go and knock their door yeah. and say, "Hey, I made this for nothing. Imagine what I'd do if you gave me the budget." You know, and then that probably stands you in better stead than just wild carding Nike. Go and find out who it is that makes their commercials. And the you know? smaller companies as well, because they always want yeah. YouTube yeah. and um, Instagram, Facebook content. Now everyone wants that for nothing, and it just. You know, it, get, it gets seen. And that's what you want, really, isn't it? You want anything you make to be seen. I mean, so, okay. somewhere that, that sort of proof of concept methodology works really well in, historically, is animation. People actually making their own little short animations and they have an aspiration to go on and work on the, the, the you know, the bigger Wes Anderson type project. And you'd see them, that actually, the CV is one thing, but a little clip reel that's sometimes only 20 seconds, but really well crafted animation <coughs> self shot um, is sometimes a useful tool a useful marketing tool it's easy enough to google like you know you see a nike advert you like it's easy enough to like do the, the google detective thing and find out who was the production company there and then go, go and see if you can get yourself in the door with those guys because they're going to be the roots of them to the, what you're trying to do um i just wanted to add i i if if um are you interested in trying to be get representation from like a commercials company like a partisan is that why you're asking uh, i'm an aspiring cinematographer myself oh, okay. so i kind of want to build up a portfolio yeah you want that sweet advert money isn't it that's what you're after i guess i was just going to say because i also feel like the films you've worked on should also stand as proof of what you can do beyond just having to go and make a, a commercial for that specific reason so Again, like finding out who makes what will be used and taking the work you've already done to them should be a way. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Hi, uh, so my question is uh, towards Dion and uh, Alice mainly, uh, because you talk about funding a lot and I just uh, wonder if you're talking about um, fiction or both documentary, because I'm personally more interested about uh, documentary and directing producing, so I just want to know if uh, it's basically the, the same path, or do you treat documentary differently to fiction? Do you want to get um, uh, We do far less documentaries. We do have a few on our slate, but um, I think it's because, you know, within the BBC there's so many uh, departments. There's drama who do TV, there's comedy, there's Storyville, so a lot of the time it might feel like we're not the right department for that, but I would look on 
uh, Storyville's website, for example, to see how their commissioning process works. Um, but also we try and talk a lot between departments. So if we're meeting, meeting filmmakers who we feel like maybe we're not, they're not right for us, um, we'll try and put them in touch with other people within the institution. Um, and in terms of the network, emerging talent funds um, we only uh, distribute funds for fiction so it's live action or animation um, the BFI lottery funds for documentary are distributed via um, an organization called the Doc Society um, and they uh, they've just launched their second open call for feature for, for feature pitches and they also have um, a short film open call as well that's the first one is closed I'm not sure about when the next one's opening, but they're really worth following just in terms of um, documentary um, news and updates. Um, having said that, although the funds that we run aren't open to documentary makers, the regional activity that, that I run in the Southwest, like the networking events um, and other things are completely open to all. So um, I can circulate all of those, those feeds. So if you do graduate and sort of stay in the Southwest, or in fact, whichever region you go to, you know where the network um, channels are, because although the funds aren't for documentary, there might be other um, sort of news and opportunities that, that we share that would be of interest. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, funding for dogs? Yeah, I mean, there are a whole host of fund um, for documentaries that are kind of international so you can apply you know as a kind of resident of the UK um, and those I mean doc society it, you know is one of the significant ones but there's depending on what the the subject matter is there will be a fund that you can apply to for it and chicken and egg is an example that's kind of more female um, filmmakers, Ford Foundation, Sundance is a, is a kind of, um, you know, obvious one, and that's one that I apply to. And a lot of them have, you know, it's not just that they give you money. They kind of, if, if they support your project, they, you know, might fly you out to the film festival or, you know, they'll, they'll help um, develop creatively and in terms of, uh, you know, support you moving it forwards. So those are, are kind of really, yeah, kind of great to know about. And often they, you know, there's a lot of documentary festivals um, <coughs> and that's a kind of good place to start to get your head around what is possible. And, you know, Storyville, you know, you can also come in with a European funder and grant. So the more ambitious, you know, and you want to do a kind of long form documentary film, then you, you start having to put together a finance plan that, you know, brings together those different you know, funds and sometimes private equity and, and stuff like that. And I think so just the, you know, this idea of an audience, like I think it is really essential, you, you know who your audience is and how to find them, but that doesn't mean you have to make something that's kind of commercial in it, you know, in a sense. So places like Sundance are set up and, you know, you guys to say, here's a space where you can develop fantastic work that could be critically acclaimed and might be really successful, but we're not judging it first and foremost on whether it's going to be, you know, like getting a massive return. And so those, I mean, it is, you know, it, it, we're not like kind of overwhelmed by kind of people offering money on those terms, but there are places you can go to. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, yes. Yeah, fe Festival-wise, there's, you know, yeah, a couple of really strong festivals. Obviously, Sheffield Dock Fest is yeah. brilliant space to go. Um, has, you know, a huge market place element to it, but also um, the, the programme's great. And there's a smaller one called Open City Docks, which is in London, yeah. um, which is really good as well in terms yeah. of panels and masterclasses. Yeah, and IDFA, which is in Amsterdam, and they also have a fellows programme. So again, if you apply to that, and then they cover you for you to go, and then you're going to meet people. And so it's really worth tapping into all those those opportunities. Questions? Yes. Hi. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just want to ask that. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about the uh, recruitment process for independent film or film productions. Uh, how is your recruitment process? And is there any challenges you have to overcome into, like, recruit your people and your core team? Is that, that one I aimed at me? Yeah, like, uh, okay. in the, uh, like independent sector. And um, yeah, like I said earlier, I mean, the, the thing of independent film is, you know, you, especially the lower down your, the budget ladder you start to go, you know, it's not glamorous. You know, you, you need people who you feel... Um, 
are going to put up with the trenches with you. I mean, you know, I always try and be, you know, when I'm, when I'm, you know, hiring people is finding people who are, you know, amenable to, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fair. I never go long work hours like a lot of these indie directors do. I always make sure people got their own room and they're, you know, they're fed and all this stuff. You know, I think if you come across a producer, a director that isn't bothered about your well-being as a crew member, then don't work with that guy first and foremost. But for the ones that you do find, like myself, um, we tend to go for crew members who, you know, they feel like they're going to muck in. It feels like it's important to them that this turns out well, that they want to run off afterwards and say, hey, I was part of that, you know? And I think um, it, it really becomes about attitude a lot of the time, you know, when we're sitting down and, and you know, meeting people, if we're doing a hiring process, it really, come, it really comes down to, do I feel this person actually wants to be here or do they just want the paycheck, you know? And of course you just want the paycheck, but at the same time, it's about being passionate about your craft as well. And, you know, the, the funny thing with this industry is it's got a strange way of sanding your passion away very quickly if you let it, you know? So you have to keep the fire in you and you have to work with people that respect you as a crew member and they'll respect you back. And I think that will breed that word of mouth I was talking about earlier and you'll find yourself, you know, going from film to film because like these guys have, have said a dozen times, you know, there's... There's, there's a market for you, like we want the crew, you know, and it's, it's those people that are willing to fill the gaps and work hard and are recommended that are, that are filling the spaces. So, yeah, I think attitude first and yeah. foremost for me. I mean, the other thing is um, industry intelligence is, is a lot easier to access than, than it used to be. So, you know, following publications like Screen and Deadline and others, paying a care to what the BFI are posting in terms of their the films that they're funding. Um, I do find that there are a couple of good regional offices in terms of <coughs> dotted around the UK. I don't know where, where home is for you, but you know, Screen Yorkshire, Berkshire, um, Liverpool, Manchester, they all have dedicated filming offices, you know, and they are on a bound to share that intel with you. If you go to a production company, a production company might not want to necessarily share too much ahead of time, but a film office or a state institution, you know, they're on a bound to, to share that intel with you. Um, something I always used to do as an AD is uh, every month I used to phone each of the, the studios and 95% of the time the studio front gate would tell you, no, I'm not going to put that call through, we haven't got anyone coming in this month, but sometimes you'll just glean that little bit of, of intel. So I think it's about trying to make sure that you stay informed and then if you do find yourself with the opportunity to present yourself or to go into interview, it's really just, again, getting those, those basics right, turning up on time, having a sort of well-crafted CV, looking like you're dressed appropriately for the day's work. You know, it's all of those little simple things that will, you know, why trip yourself up by, by doing those, thing, those things wrong? But, you know, nothing can beat sort of industry intel, really. And, and we are more saturated now than I think we've ever been in terms of that detail being being out there. Let's get more questions in because we don't have much time left. Yep. Yep. Hi. Um, I guess this is sort of everyone. Um, you sort of touched on film festivals before. How important do you think they are in sort of getting recognition for yourself and also sort of distribution for your film onwards? Mm. <laughs> um, are you are you focusing on short films for now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think it depends on you and where you are as a filmmaker and what you want that film to be and do. Um, festivals are, I think, imp very important as people's careers progress, but they're not the only route, and it's really important to remember that. So I think you need to think strategically about what piece of work you have made, where it best sits, and where you're going to find that audience for it. Um, and if that is potentially a festival audience, then that's fantastic. But there are other ways to, to develop an audience. I mean, I think what's great about festivals is you can um, obviously, you know, it, de it depends again, what do you want that piece of work to achieve? So. If you are first starting out, you might look at um, some festivals that might have a connection with that short. Is there a, a, a connection thematically? Is it a genre film? You know, could you do the genre festival circuit? Um, are you, you know, are you making um, work with an LGBT focus? Therefore, you know, does it fit within that? But 
you can think broader as well, but that's sort of very much a starting point. And then as, as you move up, it's about, you know, who do you need that film to be seen by? You know, who do you want it to get in front of? Is it a calling card for your feature? Is it, you know, for you to really move up to that next step? And where are you going to find that audience? Um, so I think they're important, but I also don't think that... Um, that you should be too deflated if you don't have much success at first. I think you have to be really realistic about the volume of short films being made right now and the volume of submissions coming into festivals. I know Encounter's got about mm, bit over 3,000 submissions last year for 200 slots. I think Sundance is in excess of 9,000 submissions. So being really strategic about what you've made and where it needs to sit and starting that thinking process about what your work is, where it sits, what, what the audience is for it. You should be starting that with shorts. Um, there are some great festival lists out there that you can start researching. There's um, the British Council Festival list, the BAFTA Festival list, starting to, to, to work out... Um, where your film will sit, talking to other filmmakers, finding out what <coughs> festival journey they've done, and also being aware of the sorts of films doing the main festival circuits as well, finding films that might have a similar feel to yours or a similar tone and looking at the festival circuit that they've, that they've done and then making the most of the time if you get there. But equally, you might make a film that just needs to be online because that's where it needs to be and that's where you're going to drive the best audience and that's where you're going to get the most views. So definitely think about it, but don't feel like it's the only way to get your work out there. I feel sometimes like people, <clears throat> because it's so easy to apply for film festivals now, you go onto various websites, you can click the button, and after a while you've applied to 20 or 30 of these things and you've paid £5. And you're massively pounds. in debt. Yeah. And then by the end of it you get nothing back. Yeah. You know, this is what happened to yeah, me so at, again, at first, yeah. obviously. And yeah. I don't know, you, you, after a while you get slightly cynical yeah. about how often your film actually gets viewed. Is that something that... Oh, that's one of the, one of the <laughs> myth questions. Every film festival I've ever had anything to do with watches every single submission, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anything to do with the festival if they didn't because you've paid your money. So I can't speak for every single film festival out there, <laughs> but any film festival I've had in work with watches every single submission. Of so, But... It is, it is deflating, of course it is, you know, it's rejection. Don't spend Rejection's all your really budget. Hard. Don't spend, but keep a line in your budget. Yeah. Always have a festival submission line in your budget and don't let anyone touch it. Yeah. They'll, they'll want to touch it. It's because it's, it's, it, festivals are expensive. They're not yeah. this, like, you know, free, free thing. But, I mean, from my own personal experience, you know, I, in, uh, you know, the first film kind of did its thing and it was very, you know, it was profitable for everybody involved, so everyone was happy. And then I very quickly rolled into this next movie, which is sort of a, a strange character horror film, but doesn't really turn into a horror film until the back 40. And so, you know, we kind of were thinking, well, what do we do with this film? And uh, I personally didn't believe it was a festival film, so kind of wasn't really engaging with that element. And then somebody said, well, just, you know, we'll just submit it to this one. And I said, okay, so we took a punt and we submitted it to Fright Fest in London. And they chose it as the opening night movie. So all of a sudden, there was just this huge explosion of press around me. And it's that wave that's really, you know, like now it's like I meet investors. They go, well, we like your stuff. Then they Google me after I've left the office. And I'm like, oh, you open Fright Fest. And so it can help you, but I would be targeted with it. Like, think it's about it. Film don't, just send it don't just send it to everyone. Just yeah. say, these are the only ones that matter for this film. And if it doesn't get into them, then don't cry about it. It's fine. But if it does get into them, just know there's a, there's a benefit that can be had from it, you know? Research the festivals as well. Just because you want to play in Cannes or Berlin doesn't mean your film's right for those festivals. Yeah. <laughs> so research the festivals that you think you want to play at. Look at what, what they're programming. Okay. More questions, please? Um, Nina, we've had you before. If it's all right, just up there, I can't see. Hi, yep. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, because when we graduate, we'll spend so much time doing commercials. Um, do you ever notice any talent from commercials? Do you ever work with people that, because our day jobs to pay the bills are just commercials, so <coughs> I'm more saying just to get recognized, to get noticed. Do I stand a shot <laughs> really doing an advert? Maybe well, uh, anything, noticing. any medium. If you know, you this is my like one bit of advice to you all now is don't think film, film, film. I have to do that. You know, if you go and do commercials, if you go and make more short films, if you make online contract content, if you do high end TV drama, like 
or you know if you go and work on soaps if you're a director now and you went and work on the soaps now guaranteed that you'd be and you do well you could go and direct drama and like people I remember someone saying to me have you explored soaps I was like oh no like you know I'm a, fil a filmmaker but you know you're learning the discipline you're learning the skill you're learning to help to work fast to be adaptable and that all transfers so I just wouldn't rule any medium out it's all valuable it's all valuable experience all the contacts are valuable so just you know whatever platform or whichever route to get to your end goal just take it and, and just to echo Amy's point there I mean we are as the broader screen industry is recognising that um, actually getting someone to transfer over or to cross over those different disciplines is now a real benefit because they have said experience or they might have post experience or they've been working to deadlines and I think you know as Amy was saying that there was a generation or two ago a quite sniffy approach to you know even just between film and high-end TV yeah. but now the workflows and the, and the crew, budget level the and the crew, crew work flip there, back and forth absolutely. between the two and often we find that between the low end budget film mark and the high-end TV drama you know the budgets are incomparable now like you know I'm working on big budget stuff that you know that you wouldn't have for oh, a low a budget fit on a feature yeah. film so you know the skill and the practice is the same so. I mean I, I'd, I'd sort of slightly invert your question as well I mean I don't know which discipline you're mm -hmm. studying at the moment and where you might end up but if you sort of look at it through the other end of the telescope it's like okay I've got two people in front of me I've got someone that's actually gone out and done 20 days working on commercials or I've got someone that's been sat waiting for their opportunity on film tv or drama I know who I'm hiring mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's, 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 again, we keep on coming back to this sort of either or, and it's not. It's, it's, I, it's, I love yeah. people that work on commercials. Like yeah. crew wise, they make for the best crew because, I mean, I've personally directed, I don't know, like hundreds and 20 commercials, and like they're hard graft, and you've got like 12, 12 people from the actual client or send down their, their entire marketing team, and they're like breathing down the director's neck. And the director's passing that sort of stress onto the crew. And they're like, we've only got two days to shoot this whole bloody thing, you know. And it's the sort of this whiplash speed about commercials that when you move over to indie films, if you can find crew members that are used to commercials, they'll find indie films are like, oh, this is fun. This feels like a holiday. Mm. And they'll be having a better time on your movie, you know. So, I mean, like, the other thing just... This is where we get paid anywhere near I mean, the, other, yeah, exactly. the, other, the other thing is, is that, I mean, we've touched on it, it's pay scales, you know. I mean, I, I haven't seen the APA rates recently, but, you know pretty much it's always been because obviously it's the nature of the shorter contract is actually that commercials rates is higher than you might find yeah. in high-end TV or, or features or other so you know go and do 10 days a month on a commercial if that's your rent covered and that's your outgoings covered you've then got 20 days of the month left to to work on your other your, your other projects so balance I think yeah is fully agree. Okay. Yes, I was sorry, just going to add, can't. sorry, just <laughs> that, um, you, like, if you're a director, I don't know what you're do doing, but... Designer, um, I think. Yes, I can't see it. Is it Leah? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's all transferable, so... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and we're, anyone that works either with a new and emerging talent or in the broader sense of the industry knows that, um, you know, you've got to make a living, so nobody would ever look badly on you for making a living out of your skills. Okay. We're down to the last few, I think. Okay. Oh, up the back. Yep. Hi. <laughs> so we've got um, Mike Lee coming in a bit later, which got me thinking about um, the plays for TV he did in the 70s. And obviously, I can appreciate how much the industry has changed since then. But do you think, um, I don't know, Dion, maybe you'd be best to answer this, but please, anyone. Um, do you think there's still a place for productions like that uh, on terrestrial television? <coughs> um, I haven't seen those, sorry. Um, <laughs> but do you mean like, so it was a play that was made for, for, for TV? Yeah, so like it was all shot on one location, pretty much live, um, with like a, an ensemble cast, like no more than four or five cast members, pretty low budget basically all had very containable sort of production elements so mm. limited cast limited location normally 90 minutes running time and they were a great proving ground for theatre directors that were looking to transfer into um, filmed content um, and I think 
you know, there's absolutely space for it. I don't know who would be brave enough these days as a terrestrial broadcaster. It has to be a broadcaster to, risk, yeah. Yeah, to, 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 to do that. But it's actually what we developed the King's Speech as initially. And the BBC had a strand that uh, was on four, and they were looking just for chamber piece pieces of work. They were the, well, I say modern day, tw 10 years ago, but they were the equivalent of play, plays for today because there was just such a great proving ground for theatre directors to have that first exposure to, to filming and filmmaking. Um, Do you think it comes down to then why it is you're making it in that format? And, yeah. and you know, you, you need to look at the project and why, why is that the best way to tell that story? Why, you know, why is that the format? I think See, that's probably... We, we took instruction from that play. To my, the first film I produced was called Exam. It's one room, 12 candidates, all finishing the final stage exam for an application process. And the reason we did that was that Stuart, the direct, writer-director, we knew we couldn't go out and raise hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds, so I could pull in a favour at Elstree, I could get one stage for a number of weeks, so it was almost, it was sort of written out of necessity, which is yeah. the worst way ever to, to, but sometimes the best creativity it's, it's comes often, out of necessity. It, it's often <clears throat> the, the, the kind of the way it's done at the, the indie level is yeah. like, you know, you look at what's available to you and you might have a really cool concept that doesn't necessarily marry that, but maybe with a bit of, a bit of thought you can end up with something that creatively benefits from, from trying to get them to work together. I mean, The King's yeah. Speech, can you imagine that film in any other format than that chamber piece? I, well, I don't think it, it's the, great the, the, the way it is. But the funny thing is, is the stage play that it was when it was originally developed was just the therapy scenes that happened behind yeah. the rooms. You know, that whole pomp and ceremony was brought in as it became a bigger and bigger, bigger film. I mean, if any of you are looking at sort of single room dramas and Moon's a good example, exam, Please, you can still get it. You're worth 55p to me if you uh, <laughs> if you go and download it. Um, but those sort of single room dramas, you know, room, um, you know, all, apart from the ending, obviously, where you break out. But they're, they're often really good stretches of that sort of creative muscle because you're limited by, you know, production availability and what you have. I think you've got, a good, you've got a good chance with those kinds of things as well, with actually enticing some talent that's way outside of your budget range because they might really like the concept and they're like, oh, so it's indoors in a room, but you're only going to need me for two weeks. Go on then. Yeah. You know, whereas if you try and pitch them on, oh, hey, we're going to be outside in the forest for a month, they're going to say, I'm all right, thank you very much. <laughs> so, you know, you've got a good chance maybe of getting talent that will help you generate the kind of, you know, terrestrial interest that maybe you're looking for. Um, I was just going to add again, and like Alice was saying, it's if it suits the medium. So we, a film that we... Um, partnered on last year which came out over Chris, like just before Christmas is called Love and it was by a playwright called Alexander Zeldin um, so he has actually adapted that for film um, and it was essentially his directorial debut so it's kind of a testing ground in a way for him as well to explore film as a medium um, and in some ways I think you could still probably feel that it came from theatre but he managed to make that you know all shot in pretty much one location really work and translate to the screen. So it depends on the story you're trying to tell. Very last, yep, okay. very last question there, yep. Uh, sorry, um, how did you initially make the step from being a runner for Tiger Aspect and um, <coughs> making your own contemporary documentaries? So I was, actually I was a runner at RDF initially and then I applied for this kind of researcher's training scheme and then that placed me for I think a couple of months in Cardiff a production company and then the second one the second placement was Tiger Aspect and as part of that scheme you got kind of training and also you had to make kind of a short film and basically I made the short film while I was at Tiger Aspect and then I was also at Tiger Aspect working in their development team and managed to get off the ground this idea, which was kind of like, oh, let's do something about, you know, the history of monks, which is kind of boring, and then we changed it. But because I'd been the one on the phone to the monasteries and got the kind of relationship, then I stayed on and I left the scheme. And from that point, I then was able to, yeah, was like hired as an AP <coughs> on that and carried on. But because I'd made the short film as part of the training scheme, <coughs> I also <laughs> had that and I carried on filming and that was what became my first Storyville. So when I wasn't at Tiger Aspect working on that BBC series, I was filming 
up north on this other piece. And when I felt it was advanced enough, I took it to Storyville. Which is also just in terms of this like kind of gumption thing, I just decided that I wanted it to be a Storyville, even though it's an English story, and Storyville is an international <laughs> strand. But I was just like, had my heart set on it, and you know, and because of this, you know, part, be, not because it didn't fit though, but because it was the right type of film in terms of kind of the creative ambition, you know, whatever. So, and that, and you know, that was commissioned um, because they felt as part of an international strand, why not have an English story? So, you know, there is a, you can kind of, as long as you know why it might work for them, then it's always worth kind of being open minded. Okay. I, think that answer, yeah. I think it does. Louis, you can speak to Elizabeth afterwards, obviously. Um, uh, we're going to have to draw to a close. It feels like we're just getting started in some <laughs> ways. Um, lively debate, some good questions. Um, but we want to give you some time to come down and speak to those of you that can stay for a little while. Um, can we... Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. They didn't need to come. They came because they want to help you guys uh, giving something back. Um, can we please give them a fantastic round of applause?